Okay, well, it looks like they have all made it over to the correct Zoom link. So I apologize to those of you uh, about the confusion of being on the other link. And we will get started. So to kick us off, I'm just going to remind everyone to please mute their lines. Um, if at any time during today's call you have a question, you can unmute and ask the question or you can enter your question in the chat box. Uh, but we are here today to discuss um, the guidance and template for memorandum of understanding that was sent out a couple of weeks ago. And um, this is a Q&A session to answer any of the questions that you have. So my name is Michelle McNertney. I'm the division administrator for Iowa Workforce Development, uh, Workforce Services Division. And myself and several of my peers across the core partner agencies in Iowa, which includes the Department of Education, Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Services, and Iowa Department for the Blind, um, have been working together for the past several years on um, joint guidance related to WIOA. And so the release of MOU guidance and template along with MOU policy that was approved by the State Workforce Development Board last fall um, has all been developed by the group of people whose names are here on the screen, plus a couple of other members that I didn't get added that are, that are new to our group. So um, we are tasked with working together to issue joint policy uh, related to EOA. And that's where the guidance that you were received uh, came from. So today we wanted to um, bring you together after you've had that guidance for a little bit of time and had a chance to review it and really just give you um, some updates and, and a couple of things. We've received some questions so far that we'll answer today. And then we'll also give you an opportunity to ask any additional questions you may have. Um, once this question and answer session is done, we will post the MOU guidance, um, the template, the policy, and the Q&A document, which will really be a living, breathing document that we continue to add to. All of it will be available on the State Workforce Development Board website for you, along with the local planning guidance and, and any other joint guidance that's available. So today, um, just based off of the questions we've received to date, I, I will answer a couple of questions. Partners, Alex, Brandy, Mike, any of you, please jump in at any time. And then after we get through the questions that we've already received, we can open it up and answer any additional questions you may have. So let's just dive right in. A couple of things we have some questions about the signatories or the programs um, that are represented by the state partner, the core partner agencies, excuse me, and then just a few other questions. So we'll go right into that. So um, the signatories for the, the core partner agencies. So again, the core partner agencies, Department for the Blind, Department of Education, um, Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation and IWD, we are tasked at a statewide level with administering the WIOA core, part, core titles, which is titles one through four. And um, we represent many um, of the programs that are partners and required partner programs to the MOU. So um, I've developed a document with guidance from uh, my peers on this group that I will send out to the uh, local board staff after we're done today that says um, who the, the signatory is for each of those programs and also who should be participating in the actual local level discussions for you because it might be a different person. So hopefully that document will clarify that for you and it'll be very clear of who needs to sign and where you need to set the, the MOU signature when it's ready. And then all of the other required MOU partners, you'll, you will need to work locally to determine who the signatory is and who should be participating in your local level discussions. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so let's go into the Q&A. We have received a couple of questions um, and, and it, a lot of them center around who the partners are and who should be included on the MOU. So the first question was, have any required partners been waived from any local areas? And so I think the response to that is, is pretty simple in the fact that, that the law requires which programs are, are supposed to be a party to the MOU and those partners cannot be quote unquote waived from signing. Now, if there is a required partner program that does not operate in your specific local area, then that program would not be a party to your MOU in that local area. So for example, I know that Youth Build um, is, is a partner program that's required to sign, but is not operated out of every local area in the state. So only if your local area has a Youth Build program would you need to require Youth Build as a, as a partner to your MOU. Uh, 
Um, second question, sort of similar, um, but it's specific to the community services block grant. So, um, it, so the question was, if an organization is not providing employment and training services under their community service block grant, are they still required to participate in the MOU? So um, in doing some research, it is most likely the community action agencies in your local areas that are the community service block grant in your area. And so if they do not provide employment and training services, then they would not need to be a part of the MOU. So I think that the most important part though is the sort of definition of what employment and training services are that, that will help you make that decision. And that's something that you're gonna have to work out at a local level um, to determine if those community action agencies should be a party to your MOU or not. Um, and then again, in a local area, if there are multiple Iowa Works offices that have multiple partners for certain programs, do all of those partners have to sign the MOU? And the answer would be yes. Um, now, I think like Alex, I can see your name on the participant list. So for example, with uh, Title II Adult Education and Literacy, there might be multiple adult education and literacy providers in your local area that you would wanna probably include in your discussions. But the signature for adult education and literacy is gonna be done at the state level by Alex. So there would only be one signatory in that situation. Did I say that right, Alex? You did, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, so there might be some little nuances like that, but um, for the most part, if you, for example, if you had multiple Title I service providers, then yes, you would want both service providers to sign, things like that. But every local area will be different um, so we can't really answer specifically beyond that. Okay, so those were the, the questions that have been submitted previously. And now is a great time for us to open it up to other questions. I would also just ask, you know, my other members of the core partner group, Alex, Brandy, Steve, um, anybody, Carrie, if you guys have anything to add, please dive in and do so. Alert. Michelle, what happens if a required partner refuses to sign? I don't know, Steve. What do you think? Alert. We call Michelle. <laughs> That's a terrible answer. Um, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I, I guess what I would recommend that you do as you start having these conversations in your local area, if you have partners that are unwilling to sign or are not understanding why they need to sign, then you should be contacting us, the core partner group, and we can you know, try to provide technical assistance to help figure that out for your local area. Um, you know, it's a requirement by federal law that, that these partners are a party to the agreement. So um, I'm not sure. Well, I think it would be just a provision of that kind of technical assistance to that required partner so that they yep. understand. Yeah, I agree. Steve, you're not supposed to be asking questions. You're supposed to be answering them. Alert. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are there any other questions um, since you've had a chance to review the guidance? Michelle, there's a question uh, in the chat. Um, how detailed does the accessibility plan and data sharing plan need to be? Miranda, now that I see that, I had that. Did I skip over that question? I swear it was on here. I skipped this one. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> I thought I went through those too fast. So um, one of the sections of the MOU requires the local area to um, detail out how they're going to ensure that there's training that has been provided on data sharing. So. Um, this slide, so again, the question was, can you provide additional information or examples on what is expected with the data sharing training plan and accessibility plan? And so really the answer is you really just wanna detail out how you're gonna ensure that all necessary staff 
are trained on appropriate data sharing. So, um, you know, you need to be doing that, that training annually. So in your training plan on the MOU, you just want to give us the details, right, of how are you going to provide that training? Are you going to do a recorded webinar? Is it going to be a live training? Who's going to be providing it? How are you going to make record of that training and keep that so that when the local area is monitored, there is um, evidence of that training taking place. So those details, I don't think it has to be um, super in depth, but it's just a place for all the partners to be able to understand what the expectation will be and how it will happen. Anybody from the core partner team have anything else to add about that? I might have missed the point of it, but I was thinking that part of the question referred as well to uh, disability access. Is that possible or did I miss that? Up? Um, I don't think specifically disability access. I'm trying to remember back to the actual template, um, which I can't look at while I'm sharing my screen. Lori, are you you're on the call, right? Yep, I'm here. Do you have anything to add? Um, well, I think what Steve was talking about was the original question is, um, can you provide uh, additional information on what is expected with the accessibility plan? And I think it's just that same answer about how you're just going to ensure that um, those four areas of accessibility are carried out. Um, in a and here in Iowa, I think that you can turn to your disability access committee they have done physical and program accessibility studies in each, uh, each of the centers and should be able to provide some kind of a, uh, a plan for um, bringing things up to, uh, up to accessibility standards. I, I would suggest that's where you might turn for information on that part. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, and, and, you know, those four questions that are in that piece of the plan, it's like you said, Michelle, I don't think it has to be long, it, um, but it starts, at, starts out with things like how will you ensure, how will you do, so it, um, you know, it's, it's just an explanation of how in a local area that you're going to ensure that those four things are, are taken care of across, across the partners. And that would actually make it simple because you could just make reference to the local disability access committee will be covering those and following up and that that might just take care of it. This is Carrie. Um, I just wanted to mention too that we had the those access or those transition plans that had been developed that I think Steve and Mike were both talking about. Um, and they are on the state workforce development board page. Um, under the Disability Access Committee link for each of the former local areas. So that might be something to look at too. That would be helpful. Thank you, Karen. Michelle, this is Miranda. And just to be clear, this is ensuring accessibility for all four of those components with all of the partners, not just the partners that are in the center, correct? Correct. Um, it looks like we got another question about, will the MOU need to be re-signed by partners after including the IFA? And, and my answer would be absolutely yes. I don't know if any of the other uh, core partner policy team wants to weigh in, but just as a quick reminder, you know, we are really approaching this MOU as a two-part process. Um, the MOUs that you all are working on right now are, <clears throat> they should have expired two years ago. We've been working on extensions because of the transition to, to combining local areas and new local areas. And those are set to expire June 31st uh, or June 30th of this year. So, you know, what we really want you to focus on is getting the MOU piece in place. And then we will, we are working, not exactly right this second, but soon as a core partner policy group to start to draft that IFA policy. Um, the IFA policy is, is, what's the right way to say this? Um, it's intense, right? It's tedious. And it's going to require a lot of collaboration with a lot of partners, not just the core partners. So it's going to take some time for that to come out. 
And, and right now in our centers, you guys, you're already cost sharing, right? So we have a me method in place, which it just has not been formalized as a part of the MOU. So once we have published that statewide policy, then you would be expected to essentially renegotiate the MOU, including the IFA, and you would re-sign at that point. But that, don't worry about that happening. So I thought, well, I'm going to text, it wouldn't go through. Any other questions? Michelle, it's Miranda again. Um, just because I'm not real familiar with all of the required partners and how the, the structure works for the, the CTE program, is that usually operated out of the community colleges? I believe so, okay. but I might yeah, refer to Alex. I can, yeah, I can take that one, Michelle. Um, the Perkins that's referenced as a required partner here is um, post-secondary education level. So your connection will need to be with the community colleges. And unfortunately, um, it's not always the same contact at those community colleges. Um, so definitely, yeah. um, definitely reach out to your, your Title II providers. They might be able to help guide you to who that best person is to connect you with the Perkins representative. Um, but um, again, it could be the CAO. It could be the Dean um, over, um, over credit. Um, so it might vary depending upon your, your partner. Thanks, Alex. It looks like there's one person who's called in by phone that's not muted. If you could mute, that would be great. Thank you. And Carrie, it looks like has just put a link uh, in the chat box to those previously developed physical accessibility transition plans that might be helpful for you when you're developing these new MOUs. But I, I can't, I'm going to leave that open now. So just as a reminder as well, that the existing MOUs are, are expiring June 30th. So it is important for you to have these new MOUs signed and in place by July 1, 2021. So um, within the guidance document that was provided along with the template, there's a, a, a timeline sort of, it doesn't have specific dates on it, but an example timeline of how you could work through that over the next three months to meet that deadline um, if you work backwards from July 1. So I would recommend that you take a look at that and start working on this if you haven't already. And um, as always, if you have any questions about the MOU as you're in development, or if you have any additional questions, you can email those questions to the WIOA governance at iwd.iowa.gov inbox. And when we receive those questions, the core partner policy group looks at those together and will issue a response to you. And again, we will add any um, additional questions that we receive to the FAQ document and just maintain that on the state board website as we receive additional questions so that those answers are available to everyone. Um, is there anything else anybody from the core partner team would like to add? Nothing from me. I'll learn. I'm good. This is Brandy, I think you've covered it. I don't have anything either, Michelle. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay. Are there any other questions before we um, wrap up today? Okay. Oops. Um, if not, I think I will just say thank you from all of us on the core partner team. We know that we're asking a lot of you right now. Um, and with the newly formed local areas and, and, the, and the changes that have been taking place over the past couple of years with the system transformation, there, there's a lot of work on the board's plates right now. We understand that. 
we're here to help. And um, just, just know that going forward, all of these tasks will not be on top of each other like they are right now as we work towards getting in compliance. So thank you in advance for your efforts. And, um, you know, we're excited to see what you guys can, can uh, come up with and, and complete as your local areas continue to uh, grow. So thank you guys so much. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend and enjoys the wonderful weather we're going to be receiving. And we will talk to you soon. Thank you.